Today we're continuing to look at topics in Adam Hamilton's book entitled Half-Truths, God Helps Those Who Help Themselves and Other Things the Bible Doesn't Say. When Pastor Mary asked me, when Pastor Mary asked me to preach on Adam Hamilton's book, I thought, well, that's going to be easy because I like Adam Hamilton's writings because they're clear, they're concise, uh, they're easy to understand, and I almost always agree with them 100%. And then Pastor Mary said, I want you to preach on chapter 4. Then I looked at it. The title is, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. So the subtopics of this are really, did God write the Bible? Is the Bible God's word? Is the Bible inerrant and infallible? And should we take the Bible literally at its face value? Yep, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. You know, I have probably over the last 25 years written way over 50 different sermons. But I've got to share with you, this is absolutely the toughest one I have ever had to write. Because it deals with concepts that are so ingrained in what we believe and how we believe about the Bible and God. So I'm going to offer a disclaimer right up front. If you don't agree with me, it's okay. It won't bother me or hurt my feelings. Okay, I've got a wife and two daughters. So I grew up in a family with three women. I am used to having people disagree with me. It's okay. You notice they're not here this morning. They're actually watching online. So <laughs> they, get back, they get back on tomorrow. So I've still got a day of, anyway. You know, we, we call ourselves Christians, and we're followers of Jesus the Christ, along with about 2.38 billion other people. Of course, we all have this common core of beliefs that give us unity, unity with each other, except when we don't. For example, we all believe in the Trinity and salvation by grace. Except there are a lot of people who identify themselves as Christians. In fact, about 17 million of one denomination that believes Jesus is the literal son of God, not part of the Trinity. And why do they believe this? Because the Bible tells them that. They're Christians who believe that we gain salvation by our works and by our deeds and not by grace. And why do they believe that? Because the Bible tells them that. The amazing thing is every group, every denomination, every sect believes that they are following what the Bible tells them to do. In today's fractured society, no matter what your political ideology is, conservative or liberal or your own personal philosophy or ideas, you can probably find a group out there that will fit that. And each of those groups will call themselves Christian and say they're believing that because they're following the Bible. So, Let's start off with the first premise. God said it. Who wrote the Bible? Where did it come from? Well, we've identified that there are at least 40 authors, 40 different writers, and probably more. However, we know that Paul, when he was going blind, used a scribe to write down for him. We know that other authors in the Bible use scribes. We know that there were redactors 
and editors who adjusted things over the, over the centuries. And that impacted the contents of the Bible. Many giving some different nuances to, to the original writing. Now, of course, we're lucky because we're Protestants and we have the Bible. <laughs> you see, our Bible contains 66 books. But the Eastern Orthodox Bible has 79 books. And the Catholic Bible has 73 books. So how come we only have 66? Because Martin Luther didn't like some of them. And during the Reformation, he just eliminated them from the Bible. But that's a long, complicated story. Uh, but if we were to believe that God said it, do we believe the Bible was dictated to the authors to write in these Bibles? Or do we believe that God inspired these human authors to share what they knew and had experienced of God? In today's scripture from 2 Timothy we hear Paul say that all scripture is God breathed. Now, Paul was probably tying back to Genesis where it says God breathed into Adam and gave him life. It is God breathing into scripture, breathing on scripture that gives us life. In that short verse today, Paul uses the term theonustos. Theo meaning God, noustos meaning breath or wind or spirit. What Paul was probably saying is all sacred writings are inspired by God. But we also need to understand when Paul was saying that in today's scripture, he wasn't talking about the New Testament. He was talking about what we call the Old Testament. That was scripture. That's the scripture they're referring to in the New Testament. Because Paul was a scholar. He was probably the most highly educated of all the apostles. Paul is credited with writing 13, and some people say 14, of the books that we have, the epistles in the New Testament. The epistles. The epistles are letters. And we get to read those letters. Now, did you ever think that when you're reading the epistles that you're actually reading somebody else's mail? Because it is. It's somebody else's mail. And we have to read it with the context, the understanding of what was happening at the time and what the interactions were between the people, the person who was writing it and the people who were receiving it. These letters were passed around from various churches to churches and formed the basis, formed the, the foundation for Christianity. They were not designated scripture until the Council of Carthage when the church, church fathers designated them as scripture in 397 AD. That's over 300 years after they were written. So I think it's safe to say also that Paul would have been absolutely shocked and surprised to find out his letters became scripture because he would have never considered them as such. Now, some people also believe the Bible is inerrant, which means there are no errors and no contradictions. Now, Rob Bell points out that the word inerrant never appears in the Bible. The writers intend, instead talk about inspiration and authority. They talk about being God-breathed, but never about it being inerrant. In the Gospels, we see the writers reporting the same stories, parables, often in different words and nuances. The writers of the Bible wanted others to understand a movement and to join it. And in doing that, finding life. To describe this movement, they used images and symbols and 
parables and visions and dreams and prayers, historical accounts, everything they possibly could, every writing style to help people understand God. The Bible is not a how-to manual. The Bible is not a science textbook. It's a fascinating, unpredictable, and breathtakingly beautiful book that tells us about God and our relationship with our living God. Now, do we believe humans can speak for God? Do we believe that God can use humans to further his kingdom right here on earth? I do. I believe the spirit of God works through fallible human beings like you, like me. Have you noticed that since Pastor Mary came, she's probably watching right now thinking, oh my gosh, what's he going to say? Uh, but have you noticed since Pastor Mary came, she changed a few things? And one of the things she's changed is after we read the scripture, we no longer say, this is the word of God for the people of God. We now say, hear what the spirit is saying to the church. Because it's the spirit that's speaking to us through God's servants in this amazing book. John Wesley said, therefore I draw this conclusion that the Bible has been given by divine inspiration. Wesley also told us not to take the Bible without using our intellect. John Wesley would never have said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. He wanted us to look at the Bible through our own life experience and how we've experienced God. He also wants to look at how the Bible has been viewed and interpreted by the history of the church. Over the last 2,000 years, how has the church viewed and interpreted Scripture? We're also supposed to use reason. Sometimes we hear people attribute things to the Bible, and we use our experiences. We use how the church has interpreted that over through history, and we toss in our reason. And often what we hear just doesn't make sense. That's how John Wesley wanted us to look at the depth of the Bible. The most dangerous thing we can do is believe that the Bible is inerrant, infallible, and the literal word of God. In doing that, humanity has used the Bible for some of the most horrible behaviors imaginable. We've studied horrific atrocities committed during the Crusades and using the Bible to justify those actions. We've seen the literal words of the Bible used to oppress and suppress women, denying them equal rights. Now, I'm not going to read any of those verses to you because I've done that before in church. And when I do, I get the nastiest looks from the women in the church <laughs> as I'm doing that. And I'm sure every woman, no, every more mature woman in the church has already had somebody use, has had during their life somebody use those verses in a way that put them in their place. We've seen the Bible used to justify slavery, such as, you may purchase male or female slaves from among the foreigners who live among you. You may also purchase the children of such resident foreigners, including those who have been born in your land. You may treat them as property, passing them on to your children as a permanent inheritance. You may treat your slaves like this. But the people of Israel, your relatives, must never be treated this way. Paul tells us in Ephesians, 
Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. These are just two verses. There are many, many more. And throughout history, slave owners have used these verses to justify slavery. Why? Because God said it. More recently, we've seen literal interpretations used to justify hatred toward homosexuals. But when we take these literal passages and examine them deeply, they tend to fall apart as being anti-homosexual. When we look at the context of the culture and the history of the times, and we really dig in, we find that homosexuality was not the main issue being addressed. The circumstances in which homosexuality is referred to or referenced deals with acts of mistreatment, rape, temple prostitution, idolatry, and pedophilia. I'm confident that we all find those behaviors abhorrent and abominable. But the Bible never address, addresses a loving relationship between consenting adults. Again, we have to dig deep in and get past that literal interpretation. Now, I'm reminded of the story of the man who really wanted to follow Scripture. He really wanted it to guide his life. And so he said, each day, I'm going to pick out one verse from the Bible and I'm going to have that guide me for that entire day. And so that first day he took out his Bible and he opened it up. He closed his eyes and he went and he looked at it and he goes, love your neighbor as yourself. Fantastic. So that day he went out and he was nice to everybody and as kind as he could possibly be. Had a beautiful day. The next day he goes and he pulls his Bible out and he goes, pray without ceasing. Great admonition. So every time he gets an opportunity during that day, he prays and he has just this fabulous day. And the next day he opens up his Bible and puts a verse and he looks at the verse and he says, and if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Uh, no, let's not do that one today. And he goes, the next one, he goes, okay, here we go. And he looks at it and he goes, and if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. No, I'm not going to do that one today. He said, one more time. Third time's a charm. And Judas Iscariot hanged himself. It's dangerous to take things out of context. Now, somebody's probably thinking, wait, what about the words of Jesus? Don't we believe that he's God? Absolutely. And Adam Hamilton says, we've got to give added weight to what Jesus says and what Jesus tells us. But we've also got to remember that rarely does Jesus just say to us clearly, plainly, thou shalt not or thou shalt do this. What Jesus did was he tended to speak in parables and stories. And we draw out the meaning from those stories and what they were in the context of the time. In other words, it requires us to really dig in and look very carefully at what Jesus is saying to us in those verses. We've got to take it very seriously. The Bible's a magnificent book. It's a, it's a beautiful book. It's a joy to read. And I hope I don't make you too uncomfortable when I, I blurt out that the Bible is not the literal word of God. We're not a denomination that says, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. To follow this slogan is to make the Bible simplistic, and it diminishes its depth. 
We don't worship the Bible. We worship Jesus the Christ, who reveals his nature and the nature of God to us in the Bible. The Bible does make very clear what the literal word of God is. Just look at John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The entire New Testament is about the true word of God. So this book becomes our key to understanding the word of God, Jesus Christ, and how we bring God into our life. As we dedicate ourselves to studying this amazing book, we fulfill one of the most beautiful and powerful admonitions from the prophet Micah. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. To walk humbly with our God. And how exactly do we walk humbly with our God? We read, we study, and we live this amazing book. And this book guides us to walk humbly with our God. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the Bible inspired by you and written by men who are open to your spirit, breathing life into this amazing book. Help us, God, to understand the complexity of this amazing gift and to always use it to build our faith and further your kingdom on the earth. For this we pray in the name of the true word of God, Jesus Christ. Amen.